The Jesus Generation by Billy Graham Chapter 6 Copping Out More than a decade ago, the American president focused national attention on young Americans by inviting them to help change their world by enlisting in the U.S. Peace Corps. Not since the euphoric days of Teddy Roosevelt had young people flashed to the fore with such flair and attractiveness. But presently, observers of the American scene made a grim discovery. As President Kennedy soon declared, we are in danger of losing our will to fight, to sacrifice, to endure. The slow corrosion of luxury is already beginning to show. We were also in danger of losing much more, as we soon learned. Young Americans whose forebears had set their faces toward a plunging frontier, who had survived a civil war, who had fought two world wars to stave off the tyranny of totalitarianism, who had toiled through the drought and hunger of a terrible depression, these youthful Americans, in the eyes of our late president, were showing signs of dropping out. His warning was a prelude to an astonishing change. Soon, the idols of youth would be anti-heroes with long hair and beards, displacing the brush-cut all-American types. Soon, the gleaming hot rods of the flourishing 50s would be passé as status symbols. Instead, the average youth would become a pedestrian or a hitchhiker, roaming the open road. He would reject punching time clocks, meeting timetables, and taking showers. He, his brothers, and his sisters would migrate into the parks, the meadows, or the mountains, leaving clock and calendar with a program-minded generation. Becoming a military hero by risking his life to fight for home and country would lose its appeal. A growing minority would gather with disheveled contemporaries to seek their place in the sun by smoking pot. They might even burn the flag. Rather than conform to the American ideal of being dynamic and vibrant with enterprise, he would prefer to do his own thing, submerge his future in a subculture, and fly in the face of traditional idealism. Academicians, athletes, technocrats, and politicians no longer would be enshrined as heroes. Why strain to be a beauty queen, to become a Miss America? Why endure an unending schedule of nerve-wracking appearances when you could hold up two fingers for peace, ignore the cosmetic counter, and sit down with your flower power friends and take a drug trip to paradise. By the middle 60s, American vigor had come to a stop. The young horses were balking. They were kicking over the traces. Worse, they had jumped over the racetrack fence just as their elders had expected them to come thundering down the home stretch. Suddenly, they were nibbling grass in the infield. By the late 60s and early 70s, dropping out had replaced digging in. The cop-out had become the human symbol of being with it and where the action is. Though most young Americans continued to pursue the traditional goals of academic excellence, athletic victories, and unimpeachable character, a noisy minority applauded the new hero. Slick magazines spread his picture and his gospel. The freak was good copy and he attracted imitators. Al Cap says he created his prototype originally for his comic strip, Little Abner, never dreaming he would actually come to life. So the cop-out, what my peers called goofing off, became a fact of life. Presently, a movie title declared, Stop the world, I want to get off. And thousands agreed. But copping out offers no real remedy for the cosmic ailments that sicken our cities and soften our citizens. Cringing before a murderer has never stopped killing. And our hard-won freedoms of thought, imagination, and expression are being murdered. What we, your generation, and mine must do now is to discover who we really are, where we are, and how we got here. You need to understand why your generation is so extraordinary and different from all that have gone before, and why you, despite your quirks and confusion, are such a special person. 
You cannot change the world until those questions are answered. So let us explore a bit of history, a bit of philosophy, and a bit of theology in pursuit of the truth that can make us whole. The phenomenon of copping out probably began in homes where ambitious parents had pushed their offspring a little too hard. It was undoubtedly advanced by confrontations with teachers and by hassles with officials. When young people observed what the original dropouts were doing in the Haight-Ashbury and North Beach sections of San Francisco, in New York's East Village, and in London's King Street, their reckless way of life seemed to offer an escape. As the pressure built up, they began to sniff glue and to listen endlessly to hard rock and the new country music. Joining others of the same persuasion, girls and boys alike, they followed the example of their new heroes and moved to a thousand hippie pads. Newspapers and commentators called it the youth subculture. Sociologists wrote books about it, and parents, tuned out by deafening music and freak friends, began to go quietly mad. At first, for the young converts, it was great. The tall grass was a place to hide, a place to get high, and dream with fellow freaks of an unseen, fantastic world. This was the spaced-out way to be in clover. Strawberry fields competed with football fields for the weekender. To swing was the thing. It got one away from the square scene. With William Hedgepeth, a chronicler of the hippie movement, many youths felt that they were trapped within vast cathedrals of thought, simmering, hungering for physical contact, yet spinning out our mental energies in empty arabesques. It's time to go, to run, to rise up, fling up the window, thaw the blood, prance high in the wet grass, to shout and feel and seek new root holds in the nourishing earth. Rise up now beyond your head. Peel the plastic from your eyeballs and revel at long last in a new rapport with earth and air and your own unfettered impulses. For years, I had told young people that the only way they could change the world was by first changing themselves. And now, by the hundreds of thousands, they were changing before our eyes. But would this kind of change heal their own and society's sores? Most of us doubted it. Many of us didn't like what we saw. The hippie instinct has deep roots. Once they were called gypsies. In my boyhood, we called them hobos. They strummed banjos and sang yodeling songs. They refused to work. They bummed rides on freight trains, hitchhiked and drifted. They were not professional thieves, but they were weary of social pressures, and so they lived by ripping off, like some hippies today. My friend Sam Cole, before he became a follower of Jesus, had been king of the hobos for a generation. Sam had traveled to all but 17 of the world's countries. He said working was for horses, and he preached goodwill and brotherhood. He took odd jobs, but mostly he sponged. Everywhere he went, he said, he met droves of people who were fed up on working just to pay off the loan companies. His advice? Drop out. But most of the hope was vanished in the early 40s. A more direct ancestor was the beatnik. He was an intellectual, a poet, an artist, and a dissident. San Francisco was his original home. When the mass media discovered him in the 50s, he blossomed into a tourist attraction, and then a movement with Allen Ginsberg, David Meltzer, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti as Poets Laureate. When novelist Jack Kerouac wrote The Dharma Bums, the rush was on. By the thousands, young people adopted his Zen slogans, calling it hip talk. Kerouac's other novel, On the Road, introduced a James Deanish type of hero, uncommitted, rebellious, and a maverick. All the nonconformist train needed was a track. The beatniks built that track. They claimed they were trying to make sense of a crazy world 
and that their satirical dress and conduct would demonstrate that ultimate harmony would come only to those whose insanity matched that of society. They rapped a lot about reality. Norman F. Cantor, in his Age of Protest, says, As the Beats saw it, reality left no room for the worship of reason. Evil could not be legislated out of society. Nature, history, and humanity could not be controlled. Progress, the victim of every war, was an illusion. Death was the central reality. Their philosophy was that of Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. Their style was initially a combination of the mumblings of an absent-minded professor, the posturing of the zoot suitor of the late 30s, and the buffoonery of a Ringling Brothers clown. They were received with mingled anger and amusement. Like other seers, philosophers, and religious prophets, these speckled birds diagnosed the human condition with uncanny precision. Evil is in the nature of things and cannot be removed by legislation. Man in all that he touches is corrupt and he eventually loses control. This analysis was exactly on target from the Christian point of view and more accurate than much 20th century theology which looked at human nature through rose-colored glasses. Their crucial error was their prescription for curing human ills. In essence, their credo read, A. Progress is a false doctrine. B. Imminent death, perhaps the ever-present bomb, makes planning folly. C. Live for today alone. Live until the senses sing. Do it here and now. It was essentially the same philosophy expressed by Hugh Hefner with his Bunny Girls and Playboy magazine. But Hefner went first class and soon made his glossy magazine one of the most popular in the world. The Beatniks preferred simplicity and a primitive lifestyle. If only they had begun their program with God. The first and second commandments are the only therapy the world has ever needed. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Those beatniks begat both the hippies and the new left. The beats had deliberately separated themselves from other students by wearing beards and stained Levi's, and they indulged in kicks they could realize through their eyes, ears, and skin. Otherwise, they kept their cool. Their successors, the hippies, added long hair, beads, necklaces, headbands, bells, and flowers, and were soon nicknamed flower children. Neither parents nor police officials were amused when they learned that the latter also treated their bodies as electrochemical power plants, going from marijuana to hash, to speed, to LSD, and eventually to mainlining on heroin. Their first nationally known centers were the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco and the East Village in New York. But a network of unofficial franchises quickly burgeoned from coast to coast, and presently from continent to continent. So thousands dropped out. They lived from hand to mouth, on money from home, and on earnings from occasional jobs, panhandling and freeloading. They formed communes, or pads, of 10 to 30 people, each chipping in his bit and in turn hoping for a bite. They surreptitiously passed dope and drugs to each other with or without cost. They communicated through their bodies. Please touch became a way of life. In 1967, they hit the headlines with their first human be-in. The scene was San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. Press and TV sent battalions of photographers who spread the story. At first, they displayed a certain winsomeness. They were young, sincere, and inordinately pleased to be doing their own thing. The irony was that each person's own thing was just like all the others. Most important, they were free. By midsummer, additional thousands were flooding the nation's hashburies, among them runaways, dropouts curiosity seekers, students, psychopaths, 
and drug pusher, pushers moving in for the kill. Norman F. Cantor's Age of Protest describes the consequent bedlam. Idealism competed with tragedy. A hippie group called the Diggers, named after a 17th century band of utopianists, collected clothing and food for new arrivals, giving it away for free. But the summer proved to be a bad scene, a bad trip, despite Diggers' efforts, despite the hip job corps, despite the free medical clinic, and despite all the love and flowers. The summer hippie had nowhere to live. They slept in the streets and the doorways. They begged from tourists, took impure LSD, and got hooked on methadrine. Things became so bad in the San Francisco utopia that the Hashbury girls decided to wind things up with a funeral, filling a coffin with beads, bells, clarinets, kazoos, guitars, Zen manuals, and water pipes. They hoisted it to their shoulders and paraded through Hashbury for the last time, proclaiming a brotherhood of free men and tossing the coffin symbolically on a flaming funeral pyre. The next day, the groovy shops and crash pads began to close. But the cop-out religion had spread like a contagion. Young people gathered in huge sit-ins, lions, teach-ins, and love-ins. I remember being in Winnipeg, Canada, when a crowd of 3,000 youths had gathered on the lawn in front of the provincial parliament buildings. After one of the crusade meetings, I put on a cap, a sweatshirt, and dark glasses and attended their love-in. I watched these young people doing their thing. With some of it, I was disgusted, but I was overcome with compassion. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Involved in an orgy of quest for meaning in their lives, they seemed to be searching for someone who could give them authoritative answers. The next Sunday, hundreds of these young people came to our meeting and scores came forward to find their answer in the person of Christ. Their movement peaked in the summer of 1969 at Woodstock, New York, when almost a half million youths gathered to listen to rock bands, smoke pot, rap with each other, and to say symbolically that the needs of human beings were more important than winning in Vietnam or going to the moon. Though rock festivals now seem to be out, the appeal of hippiedom continues. Once fiercely anti-establishment, the movement now has its own establishment, which some have called the disestablishment. It is firmly based on hundreds of campuses, parks, and village squares around the world. Its heroes are the singers of the music their poets have composed. Its uniform is long hair, midnight cowboy jackets, leather fringes, Indian beads, and bell bottoms. A primitive lifestyle has often been an attractive option for people who have found the world too brutal and too complex to endure. Its emulators include many Hindu mystics, certain ancient and medieval monastic orders, several Buddhist sects. In the more inglorious column for those whose wicks have burned low, it may be the least intolerable option open to them. But what of the young people themselves? Has their renunciation and rejection of the square way of life healed society? Has it healed their own malaise? Obviously not. So if we are truly concerned, no matter what our generation, we must understand the causes underlying their retreat, and then we must make a judgment. We can begin with the impact on youth of the mass media. Marshall McLuhan has written that TV produced a global village within whose limits we all now live. Its citizens, he says, react to electronic and print stimuli in identical emotional patterns. Today, panic is piled on panic as we listen, watch, and read. As an experiment, he suggests that you count the impacts per day on your eyes, ears, and brain, flung into your mind stream with all the shock power that clever communicators can muster. Alexander Klein calls it media overkill, and he observes dourly, the Republic is bleeding to death, and we stand by watching 
as though it were a spectator sport. So many youth feel trapped and they decide that their only option is dropping out. What has trapped them? Another factor, which is fairly recent, is their extended adolescence. Did you know that in earlier periods of history, adolescence was virtually unknown? As soon as one married, one became an adult. Marriages took place at age 14 to 16. Today, sheepskins and diplomas must be acquired ahead of a wife. Today, the span between childhood and adulthood may extend over 10 years. Deferred adulthood is synonymous with deferred responsibility. Also required is the postponement of such aspects of maturity as making decisions about life and commitments that are necessary to a fulfilled life. Most important, it forces the student into an unnaturally passive role at a time when every instinct cries out for participation in the challenges of his 20s. We adults are much concerned today about trusting our young people. Some of us fear their lack of experience. It is interesting to me that a 20-year-old Greek or Roman youth was sometimes an officer commanding an army or a soldier conquering an empire for his emperor or king. Alexander the Great was only 21 when he conquered the Balkans, 22 when he crossed the Hellespont, and 24 when he established the city of Alexandria in Egypt. By the time young American doctors or lawyers are hanging out their shingles, Alexander had conquered most of the ancient world. Ivan the Terrible was a boy of 17 when he forced his nobles to crown him Tsar of all the Russians. The Battle of Crecy was won by a 16-year-old stripling named the Black Prince. Joan of Arc was only 17 when her army captured Orleans. During the Middle Ages, youths 10 years old became pages in the households of knights and nobles and were treated as adults. In England, they were considered grown up as soon as they were apprenticed to a craft or trade. By their 14th birthday, girls were either married or working as cooks or waitresses, both adult occupations. Eric Hoffer has pointed out that nothing in medieval dress distinguished the child from the adult. The moment children could walk and talk, they entered the adult world. Wild Kids. An interesting study by Frank R. Donovan reminds us that American boys once entered Boston's Latin school, equivalent to a modern high school, at the age of eight and went on to college at 14. Admiral Farragut, went to sea as a midshipman at the age of 12. Our Annapolis graduates become midshipmen at 22 to 28. Achilles fathered a son when he was 15, Donovan claims. Helen of Troy was 12 when Paris carried her off to be his bride. Daphnis was 15 and Chloe was 13. Juliet was 14. But the young did more than make early marriages. Eric Hoffer says they acted effectively as members of political parties, creators of business enterprises, advocates of new philosophical doctrines, and leaders of armies. Many of the wars in our history books were fought by teenagers. There were 14-year-old lieutenants in Louis XIV's armies. In one corps, his oldest soldier was under 18. Over the years, the period of deferred maturity has lengthened. As social conditions improved, some families became able to get along without the earnings of their children. With leisure time and well-filled purses, fathers could afford to send their brightest offspring to college. Usually it paid off financially and the kids loved it, wearing beanies, joining imitation Greek fraternities, and exercising their unearned independence. Soon they were a breed apart, with a talent for aggravating their elders. In 1904, Dr. G. Stanley Hall, a physician, wrote a thick book about them called Adolescence. It confirmed their special status. 
and it recognized the new period between childhood and adulthood as potential dynamite. The passing years have confirmed the good doctor's judgment. The years have also seen a multiplication of problems that verges on the astronomical. Some sociologists maintain that young people like the system so much that they run the risk of becoming permanent adolescents. A valedictorian at Amherst is reported to have said as he received his diploma, our parents and our teachers believe in adulthood and maturity. Our wish is to stay as immature as little children. A McCall's Magazine article says there are four characteristics of these young dropouts. One, they have above average intelligence. Two, they are creative and artistic. Three, they come from broken homes or homes where parents do not get along. And four, they feel unloved and rejected. At least partially, it seems, the parents are at fault. Today's home provides little work. By and large, chores are a thing of the past. When most people talk about work, they downgrade it with reference to long hours, low pay, and short vacations. So average young men and women arrive at college with little experience, unless they come from a farm, and with their image of honest toil considerably tarnished. On the other hand, they are experts on leisure, water skiing, dancing, rock music, rapping, TV watching, etc. Theodore Rozak, the sociologist who wrote The Making of a Counterculture, rationalizes. The adolescents who protest loudest today were the babies who were picked up when they bawled and the beneficiaries of the permissive child rearing habits that have become a feature of our post-war society. Their kindergarten finger painting was thumbtacked to the living room wall and pridefully displayed as a sample of Junior's genius. As adolescents, they got a car of their own or the use of the family vehicle with attendant sexual privileges. They passed through school systems riddled by progressive classes which have to do with creativity and self-expression. High school was a lark because nobody expected them to learn any marketable skill. Economic security was something they came to take for granted. Finally, they learned they could talk back to their home folks without fear of being thrown out. And the product was a new uncompromised personality, flawed perhaps by irresponsible ease, but also touched with some outspoken spirit. Perhaps this is the place to say that most parental faults are inadvertent. Parents do overindulge their children, giving them a profusion of material things. This mistake can be disastrous. I have an actor friend who, having given his son every single item for which he expressed a desire, found that boy confronting him one day saying, Dad, I hate you. When the stunned father recovered enough to ask why, the youth told him, because you've given me too much. Without the stabilizing effects of earning one's way, of making decisions, of sweating hard to attain some kind of goal, young people are grievously handicapped. Another problem that bugs youth is parental supervision and control through adolescence. Knowing when to turn loose is a puzzling problem for my generation. In the long run, it must be done, but when is the right time? If parents hold on too long, grief, heartbreak, and lifelong wounds may result. To most adults, copping out seems to be a repellent practice, but it is not necessarily all that bad, for I have found that it may have spiritual significance. Sometimes, the extreme difficulties in which young people find themselves become God's opportunity, opening up a dialogue. We parents must face a couple of things here. First, that a concerted attack is being made on our young by an enemy who fights with drugs, pornography, and radicalism. Second, that young people, no matter how beleaguered or how far gone, need not be losers. They can be winners. 
I have a friend in Florida whose son dropped out at 17. He rebelled against everything his parents stood for. Leaving home, he wandered to California. Broke, lonely, discouraged and on drugs, he was hitchhiking one day when a truck stopped. Three hippie types were in the cab. When they asked where he was going, he answered, nowhere. Then get in, they said. They were Jesus people, and they had stopped because they somehow sensed his need. They took him in, loved him, provided for him, and led him to an experience with Christ. That boy's life was completely transformed. He went back to his parents, married a Christian girl, and is now attending a university. A new creature in Christ, he is no longer a loser. Some young people have rejected us older citizens as leaders and advisors, and with good cause. You've got us into our longest and most discouraging war, you assert. You've created a society with so much crime in it that the streets are not safe for decent people. You've let technology run wild until the earth is corrupt and its water so polluted that nobody may be around in another decade. Worse, your institutions do almost nothing to improve matters. So step aside, man, and give us our chance. Let me talk back for a moment. You say stop war, but you do not tell my generation what to do with those who keep on causing wars. You tell us to get rid of pollution in the environment, but you are not willing to stop smoking or to stop driving your car. And what about the pollution of venereal disease, VD, which many of you spread, and which may eventually destroy many more people than war? You demand that we stop the killing in war, but thousands are killed and injured every year by teenagers driving too fast or under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And what about those of you who are killing yourselves with alcohol or heroin overdoses? You claim that you worry about the population explosion, but illegitimacy among teenagers rises by the hour. It is easy to knock society's tough problems, and then when no instant answer is given, to cop out and sneak back into being an adolescent. One thing we all must learn is that problem solving is tough demanding all that you are. You don't solve problems by turning on and copping out. Then what should you do? This book is my answer. If you are a young man or young woman hooked on dissent or despair, ready to split, then lend me your attention. My answer concerns your dreams and the element in your makeup called faith. All that God requires of anyone in taking his first step toward him and toward total self-fulfillment is faith. Faith in his word that teaches that God loves you and that you were alienated from him by sin, that Christ died on the cross for you, that when you make a personal surrender to him as Lord and Savior, he can transform you from the inside out. I have learned that there is an unexpected yearning within the hearts of many so-called hippies. In Watts and Berkeley, in Sydney and London, in Paris and New York, they have revealed themselves to me and my associates. Their goals often seem obscure. They don't know the meaning of getting ahead. They live in a haze of romanticism. But when they find Christ, they discover that life takes on meaning and significance. Satisfactions of which they formerly dreamed become vital and real. They do get high, though not on chemicals. Now their mind expander is a personal relationship with Christ. As I prepared this chapter, the subject of copping out through drugs was presented in articles in Look and in Listen magazines. The story in the former tells of a hard-won victory over heroin. Its hero is Christ. The story in Listen is one of tragedy. A railway worker found the corpse of a young man in a boxcar. A letter written to his father was in his pocket, 
along with an empty pill bottle. The youth had copped out. The tragic essence of his letter was this. Dad, the reason I'm doing this is that dope has ruined my life and taken away my happiness. I could not live in the state of mind I was in. Please don't hate me too much. I thought I had found truth through what I was doing, but I found out too late that I was tripping out on death. I hope to God that all the other people taking dope find that out too, and they don't learn it too late. From your son with love, Rick. Rick had an alternative, if only he had known it. He could have lived and become a victor, not a loser, if someone somewhere had told him about Christ. Already it has happened to thousands. Today it is happening on a scale never known anywhere on earth. Look magazine quotes one minister as calling it, from a short perspective perhaps, the greatest awakening in the history of the church and kids are leading it. Thousands and thousands of young people, upper middle class kids and poor kids, and often formerly very spaced out kids, have obviously found an inner real religion. The article says that the movement came to the fore in Orange County, California, where an entire motorcycle gang was converted and is now a band of disciples on wheels. In 1969, our team conducted a crusade there in Anaheim Stadium in Orange County, the home of the California Angels. It was attended by more hippies than any crusade I ever held. In each of the 10 services, as many as 3,000 persons came forward to make decisions for Christ, a surprisingly high percentage being hippies. Every night, they presented a psychedelic sight as they streamed forward in bell bottoms, in guru robes, bearded and beaded, long hair flowing to their shoulders, and all in one way or another asking, what must I do to be saved? There was the addict who had started on pot, then sped through LSD and amphetamines, and then went on to heroin. Coming forward, he asked, can Christ really get this monkey off my back? I've tried to kick it cold turkey, but nothing works. Receiving Jesus, he was back the next night with a friend in a similar predicament. There was the teenage girl with the especially beautiful face, but for her, life was anything but beautiful. Her long blonde hair dangled down over her swinging smock, and it in turn draped down over her dragging bell bottoms. She was barefooted. This place is filled with love. I can't get over it. Everyone seems to love each other. Over and over she said it, both before and after receiving Christ. A shoeless guru stood nearby, bushy hair falling down his back to match his cascading beard. God has been looking for me all my life, he said, and tonight he finally found me. We should have been hitched up years ago. This awareness of being lost and the consequent craving for identity in another community of kindred spirits may be the greatest hope of the so-called hippie movement. Perhaps there is this providence in the copping out movement. The lostness it implies opens the door to the one who said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See John 8, verse 32. He also said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. See Luke 19, verse 10. And Jesus issued that invitation not in the temple, the symbol of the religious establishment, but under a tree in the natural world where dropouts congregate today.